I'm Mr. Richman, and this is your Math 2, Unit 2.4 Lesson Summary. In Unit 2.4, we're going to take a look at some of the theorems and postulates that exist between parallel lines cut by a transversal. Uh, so what a transversal is, is any line that's coming through and intersecting through two different lines at two different spots. So you can see here I have parallel lines cut by a transversal. Um, first vocabulary we're going to deal with today is, is conjecture. Uh, conjecturing is something that you're going to be doing a lot of uh, throughout your mathematics career. A conjecture is a hypothesis that something is true, which can later be proved or disproved. So you might have a theory that uh, angle 2 here is congruent to angle 7. You might look at the picture and think, hey, it looked like they are, etc. Um, you then go through the process of proving it to see if your conjecture is true. Um, which will now lead us into our, our first postulate. And again, remember, postulate is a, is a rule that we just accept automatically as true, which means we can use it in proofs uh, to kind of get us started. So the one that we're going to learn today is the corresponding angle postulate. Uh, it states, if two parallel lines are intersected by a transversal, like I have here, then corresponding angles are congruent. So the big thing you're going to need to know here is, is what is a corresponding angle. A corresponding angle is an angle uh, that are, is a two, uh, sorry, a set of angles that are basically in the same position. They're in corresponding positions. So for example, I have this, transver uh, this parallel line cut by this transversal, this parallel line cut by the same transversal. So when I look at that, I have a top left angle, angle 1, and I have a top left angle for the um, bottom parallel line, angle 5. So 1 and 5 are considered corresponding angles. 2 and 6 are top right, top right, corresponding angles. 4 and 8, bottom right, bottom right, corresponding angles. Angle 3, angle 7, uh, bottom left, bottom left, corresponding angles. And this postulate states that those angles will be congruent as long as these lines here are parallel. It's parallel lines cut by the transversal. Sometimes you'll deal with ones that aren't parallel, so make sure you, you know it's parallel before you assume they're congruent. So by that uh, postulate, angle one is congruent to angle five, two congruent to six, three congruent to seven, four congruent to eight. Now, um, this leads into a lot of other theorems that we can uh, run off there knowing uh, there's so many congruent sets of angles here. Um, we know already from a uh, previous session that vertical angles are congruent. Well, that means angle 1 is congruent to angle 4. Now, I already know from this posture, though, that angle 1 is congruent to angle 4, which now means by the transitive property, angle, one's congruent, or angle 4 is congruent to angle 5. So I have these alternate interior angles that are congruent. Same can happen here with 3 and 6. So there's a lot of uh, different angles that you can find are, are really congruent here via this postulate and other theorems that you've learned, but it will involve some proof to be able to use them first. Um, so I would look through the book at them because um, it does go through how to prove each uh, one of these individually. I won't have the time to do all of them. I will do one proof. I'm going to show you the alternate interior angle theorem proof, um, but these are the other ones you need to be aware of and know. Uh, they are the alternate interior angles are congruent. If the lines are parallel like this, just like we just saw, then the alternate interior angles are congruent. Alternate interior angles because it's going to, it might be tough for some of you to remember which ones are which. Um, when they say alternate, they mean they're on opposite sides or alternate sides of the transversal. So anytime you see alternate, opposite sides of the transversal. Uh, if it says same side, then they have to be on the same side of the transversal. Okay? And when they say interior, they mean they're in between the parallel lines. They're on the interior of the parallel lines. And when they say exterior, they have to be on the outside of the exterior, uh, on the exterior of the parallel lines. So alternate interior angles are congruent, four and five, three and six. Alternate exterior angles are congruent, so alternate means they have to be on opposite sides, um, and exterior. So alternate exterior would be one and eight, two and seven. Same side interior angles are supplementary, so not congruent, but supplementary, meaning they add up to 180. So same side interior, so inside, same side, three and five are supplementary. Inside, same side, four and six are supplementary. Same side, exterior angles are supplementary. Um, so exterior out here, but same side of the transversal. So two and eight are supplementary, one and seven are supplementary. 
Okay, and we're going to use these rules to basically find missing angle measures and do proofs. So let's start with my first example here. I gave you uh, two lines. Um, I say that they are parallel, so I do know A is parallel to B, which means I can use the corresponding angle postulate. Um, and they start by giving me the measure of angle 1, which I'll label. They say that this is 100 degrees. Now I'm going to use my corresponding angle postulate and other postulates that I know or theorems that I know to continue to prove what angles are, find out what these angles are. So let's start with this. If the measure of angle 1 is 100 degrees, then my postulate states its corresponding angle which would be angle five, because angle one's in the top left, angle five is in the top left, is also 100 degrees. So I can start with that. Now I want to systematically start finding all the angle measures. Well, if I look here, this transversal is a line, which means one and two make a linear pair, and five and six make a linear pair. And linear pairs add up to 180 because they're supplementary. So I can figure out now then that angle 2 must be 80. So that they actually add up to 180 degrees. Which means angle 6 is also 180 degrees. So let me just set up where I can write some of these in. And we said we found that angle 6 is 80 degrees as well. And now from here I can start to use um, other linear pairs, vertical angle rules, whatever I, I want to use to get there. But I have another line, which means 1 and 3 is another linear pair, which means this must be 80. Okay, which means 4, because it's still again forming a linear pair, must be 100. Corresponding angles are congruent again, so 3 is congruent to 7 by the corresponding angles postulate. So 7 is 80 degrees. And 4 makes a linear pair, like I said, so that makes that 100 degrees. Um, and 4 corresponds to 8, so 8 must be the same as angle 4, so it's 100 degrees. So you see how one postulate just opens the door to find a lot of angle measures. We actually can know every angle measure in this situation. And that's kind of what we're going to do when we do a proof is just like we did there, just through reasoning and following those postulates, find what the missing angles are, and now actually justify each of these with reasons. So we're going to use the same diagram to prove the alternate interior angle theorem. So I'm given the information above. So we're going to say we are given that A is parallel to B and the measure of angle 1 equals 100 degrees, we want to prove the alternate interior angles theorem. So more specifically, we need to prove that some alternate interior angles are congruent. So angle 2 is congruent to angle 7. And so we want to prove angle 2 is congruent to angle 7. Keep in mind we can only use postulates. Uh, some teachers will let you use theorems. Some will say, let you, since you've already done the vertical angle theorem, that angle 1 is greater than angle 4, uh, angle 3 is greater than angle 2, etc. And then in that case, there's different pathways to this answer. Um, but it's kind of up to the, up to the teacher. So they'll you know, let you know what, what their policy is with that. I'm going to try to do it with, with only postulates. With the main postulate we have learned are the corresponding angle postulate. We've also learned the linear pair postulate. So those are the two that I'm going to kind of use to help me get there. So, um, some things I know. The corresponding angle postulate is going to give me a lot of info. It's going to let me know that angle 1 is congruent to angle 5. And it's going to let me know that angle 3 is congruent to angle uh, 7. And that's the first bit of information I'm going to need uh, to kind of get going is that those sets of angles there are congruent. Um, now, I also know the linear pair postulate, which is what I use basically to help me get angle 3, um, which will then give me corresponding angles. So if I know angle 1 is 100 and this is 80, then I know this 70 is 80, I know 5 is 50, and I know 2 is a linear pair, and so that's 80, and it should get me to where I want to go to prove angle 2 is congruent to angle 7. So these are congruent by corresponding angles. So I'll write corresponding. Remember, you always want to make a plan when you do a proof. Um, so I've got that. Um, I also know that there's some linear pairs in there, so let's talk about those. So I know the measure of angle 1 
plus the measure of angle 2 equals 180. And I know the measure of angle 3 plus the measure of angle um, 1. Let's do that. Or, yeah, let's do that. Measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 3 is 180. And there's actually a lot. I could do 2 and 4, but I kind of want to see if I'm actually going to need all of it. And so if, let's see if this statement alone kind of gets me where I want to go. So this is the linear pair postulate. Um, I can now set these equal by substitution. Um, which the subtraction property yields to me that 2 and 3 are congruent. So 2 and 3 are congruent. And I know that 3 is congruent to 7 because they're already corresponding angles. So I now know that the measure of angle 2 must be equal to the measure of angle 7 based on substitution there, which means angle 2 is congruent to angle 7. So this will be enough pathways wise to get me there. But again, you might find your own way to get to the, the answer. That's the nice part about proofs is there's varieties in the way you can go about it. So I'm going to try it this way. So the first statement I made was my givens. A is parallel to B, and that's really the only one I need. I don't need the measure uh, for this problem. So I'm not going to use it. My reason, given. What we ne went to next was to state the corresponding angles. So we can use the corresponding angles postulate. Angle 1 is congruent to angle 5. Angle 3 is congruent to angle 7. And again, I know there's more corresponding angles there, but I really just wanted to, to list the ones I would actually end up needing and using, and those were the only ones I needed. So that's the corresponding angles postulate. From there, we started to name the linear pairs so that we could do start to get ready to do some substitution. So the linear pair postulate states that angle one and angle two are supplementary. So I'm gonna go ahead and write it this way. Measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two equals 180. And the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle three equals 180. And that is true because of the linear pair postulate. And from there, I can now say the measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 2 equals the measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 3 by substituting them in. If I know that, then by subtracting, I know the measure of angle 2 equals the measure of angle 3. Which means angle 2 is congruent to angle 3. If their measures are equal, they're congruent. That's because that is the definition of congruence. And from there, we stated, okay, if 2 is congruent to 3 <clears throat> and 3 is congruent to 7, then I know angle 2 is congruent to 7. So my last statement I'll put here. I'm running out of room. And again, if angle 2 is congruent to 3 and 3 is congruent to 7, Angle 2 must be congruent to angle 7. My reason there, one that we haven't seen in the videos, is the transitive property. Um, that's like where I said if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Well, if, if, uh, if 2 is congruent to 3 and 3 is congruent to 7, 2 must be congruent to 7. And I have now hit my proof, which was to prove that 2 is congruent to 7. 2 and 7 are alternate interior angles, therefore, 
proving the alternate interior angle theorem. So again, lots of variety there. Um, some teachers will start to make it easier for you. As you see, they get very long. The proofs uh, here was seven steps for, for this one, and some of the other ways you do it, it could be even longer. Um, so they may start to shortcut it and let you just go straight to vertical angle theorems and start to implement theorems in the proof. Uh, but in a very traditional proof, you can only use the postulates. So um, hope that helps. Keep practicing the proofs, um, and you'll do well. Thank you, and good luck.